Hey Hannah Mouse One here. A little while back you let me know that you wanted a full tutorial on how to use the Scratch Vector Sprite Editor, so that's what I have for you today. First things first, what is the Vector Editor and how does it differ from Scratch's other editor, the Bitmap Editor? Well, Bitmap Art is built up of pixels where the colour of each individual pixel is what determines how the image looks. The issue with this is that you can see these pixels if you look closely. The images don't scale well and diagonals often look a bit fuzzy. The pixelated look can be great for retro pixel art games, but Vector Art by contrast uses maths to figure out what the shape should look like, based on information given at specific points on your sprite. Because the shape is calculated mathematically, it scales without blurring, and all the lines look perfectly crisp and smooth at any size or resolution. Now we've discussed what the vector editor is, let's dive into how it works. When you make a new sprite and click on over to the costumes tab, this is what you're met with. Some super basic interface things. You can name your sprite in this box here. These two buttons allow you to undo and redo any actions that you make, and these three buttons in the bottom left allow you to zoom in and out or snap to something in between. But in terms of drawing your sprites, let's start by looking at the brush tool. This creates a shape that approximately reflects the path that your mouse took, so it looks like you're painting right onto the canvas. You can set the colour of the brush by setting the fill colour, and you can change the size of the brush by altering this number here next to the brush icon above the canvas. However, this tool might not give you the control or the crispine perfect shapes that you're looking for. So let's take a look at how we can get some more precise shapes onto the page. For that, We'll need one of these three tools, the line tool, the circle tool, or the rectangle tool. Starting with the line tool, this lets you draw on perfectly straight lines. If you end a line right where another begins, the two lines will connect. If you press and hold shift while you draw it, it will snap to be either exactly straight up and down, left and right, or on the diagonal, and the colour is determined by the shape's outline colour. The rectangle tool allows you to draw in, surprise surprise, rectangles. If you press and hold shift, it will be a perfect square. You can set both the fill and outline colours separately for these. these circle tool is much the same but for ellipses and perfect circles when the shift key is held. You can also use the eraser tool to remove parts of the shapes and this is controlled in the same way as the brush tool and has the same shortcomings in terms of a lack of control. The fill tool allows you to change the colour of shapes or their outlines by clicking on them with you getting a bit of a preview when you hover over them and you can make the colour a gradient from left to right, top to bottom or radiating out from a point with the point being wherever in the shape that you clicked. If you've chosen to make the colour a gradient, the option to select a second colour appears, and you can easily switch the direction of the gradient by clicking swap. And if you want to use a colour that exists already on the canvas, you can use the eyedropper tool. And you can add text using the uh, text tool. And you can select the font for this for the drop down. But now we have the ability to draw shapes onto the canvas, but we need to be able to manipulate these if we're going to make more interesting sprites. For that we're going to use these two tools, the select tool and the reshape tool. The select tool allows you to, guess what, select an object by clicking it. Once selected, you can drag it around the canvas. If you drag it to the centre, of the canvas, the shape will snap in place, and if you hold shift while dragging it, it will move directly vertically, horizontally, or on the diagonal. You can resize the shape by dragging the blue dots on the blue box around the shape. Dragging the one in the centre of the top or bottom edges scales it vertically. The ones in the centre of the side scale it horizontally, and the ones in the corners scale it proportionally in both axes. You can rotate it by dragging the handle at the bottom of the selection square. You can also change the selected shape's fill or outline colour, and how thick the shape's outline is. You can move the shape above or below the other shapes, or shift it right to the top or bottom of the other shapes. And you can move the shape horizontally and vertically, delete it, or copy it. Once you have something copied, the paste button lights up and you can click this to paste your shape. The copy and flip buttons can also be used when nothing is selected, and in these cases it will apply to everything on the canvas. You can select multiple objects at once by clicking and dragging over an area containing multiple shapes, and you can add shapes to or remove shapes from the selection by shift clicking them. If you have multiple shapes selected, you can group the by clicking group. For all intents and purposes, the select tool will see these objects as one. You can select the group by clicking any one of the objects, the rotate as one, they flip as one, and so on. And you can click ungroup to separate these back out. At face value, there are a lot of similarities between the select tool and the reshape tool. You click objects to select them, select multiple by clicking and dragging, and add or remove shapes from the selection by shift clicking. However, instead of giving you a box with which you can scale your shapes, you instead see all of the points that the shape is made up of. You can also select one of these by clicking, add or remove them from the selection by shift clicking. You can also add a new point by clicking the edge of a shape, and you can drag points to a new position. There are two types of point, pointed and curved. When pointed, the edges or lines on either side of the point meet at a sharp
sharp point and move away from the point in a straight line. The pointed point is represented visually by a single filled in circle when selected. At a curved point, the lines on either side meet smoothly as to camouflage the exact point where they meet. When selected, you'll see a line with a square on the end protruding from either side of the point. And by dragging these, you can manipulate the direction of the line on either side and how far the line protrudes. You can change whether a point is curved or pointed with these two buttons here. And you can delete a selected point by clicking delete. I want to show you how you can visualize layering and shaping these shapes into a more complex artwork. And I think it would be best if I showed you with an example that you're probably familiar with. Let's say that you want to recreate this image of Mario in the scratch vector editor. Personally, I'd be inclined to start with the face. So I would select a skin tone and draw in a circle in that color. I'd shape it using the reshape tool to reflect the main shape of Mario's face. And then I'd add in the eyes. I'd add in a white circle, flatten off the bottom, and I'd copy the shape, setting the color to be a darker version of the skin tone. I'd make it slightly larger and layer it under the white one. I would then add a blue oval, longer vertically than horizontally, and shape it to fit in the bottom corner of the white shape. I would recolor this to have a radial gradient, with the center being a darker shade of blue. I would then add a lighter blue oval, smaller than the one I just added, and again adjust the shape to fit in the corner of the existing eye structure. I would then add four very thin ovals into this light blue shape, with one being stretched vertically, one horizontally, and then one on each diagonal, with the point where these meet being the center of the light blue shape. Next, I would add in a dark blue oval, the center of which being over the meeting point. I would add a circle into the bottom of this and give it a vertical gradient with it being lighter at the bottom and transparent at the top. And I would add a circle to the top of the pupil with a radial gradient of white in the center to clear at the edges. I would select the eye by selecting everything, then deselecting the face. I'd copy paste the eye, flip it, and then position the eyes in their appropriate positions on the face. For the nose, I would add a large circle in the darker skin tone color to the center of the face, where it just covers a portion of each eye. I would copy the shape, change its color to have a radial gradient of the light skin tone at the edges and an even lighter skin tone in the center and make it slightly smaller, positioning it to be on top of the darker circle. I would adjust this shape to make the bottom of it a bit more squashed. Next, I would add his mustache. For this, I would add a dark brown oval and layer it below the nose. I would point the two end points and move these up and move the point in the top center downwards. I would point the bottom center point and add two pointed points on the bottom arc of either side of this. I would add a curved point between each pair of pointed points and drag them down, reshaping them to create the bumps of the mustache. I would then duplicate this shape, darken it, and layer it beneath the original, positioned slightly lower, and reshape to appear as a shadow. I would then add a circle to each bump with a radial gradient of a lighter brown in the center and transparent at the edges. I would then make sure that the stash was positioned exactly where I wanted it. I would then add an oval below the mustache with a vertical gradient of transparent at the bottom and the darker skin tone at the top. I would then reshape it to be a slightly squashed shield shape. This is where the underlip meets the chin. For the mouth, I would add a very wide, short oval layered below the stash and reshape to be a smile with small downturns at either end. I would recolor it to be a slightly darker and redder shade than the skin. For the eyebrows, I would add a circle in the same color as the stash, then drag up and widen the bottom center point to create a crescent shape. I would position this over the left eye, duplicate it, then flip and position the copy above the right. I would then add a lighter brown circle to the side of the head and reshape this to reflect the tuft of hair that you can see over each of Mario's ears. I would then add darker brown circles over this and reshape these to be around the bottom of the hair tuft and separating the sections of the hair. I would add a skin tone circle layered behind this and would widen the top to better represent the form of Mario's ear. I would add circles of the darker skin tone and reshape these into curved thin snakes that build up the structure of the ear, as well as one to separate the ear from the rest of the head. I would duplicate the ear and hair tuft, flip it and position it onto the other side. I would then add a large red circle to the top of Mario's head to create the form of Mario's hat. I would pull up the bottom center point and widen the top. I would lower and point the two side points so that they meet Mario's head and add a curved point between each of these and the top point, dragging these outwards and tilting them to create the shape of the hat. I would give this shape a vertical gradient with the bottom being a darker shade of red and reshape it to fit around the tops of Mario's ears. For the rim of the hat, I would draw in a lighter red circle with the side points pointed and the circle reshaped to fit the line of Mario's forehead. I would widen the top of the circle, duplicate it, then darken the copy. I would position this over the original and drag down the top so that a strip of the lighter shade is visible, so that a strip of the lighter shape would be visible. I would then add a white circle to the center of the hat and layer it beneath the rim. I would squish up the bottom of the circle, duplicate it, and give the copy a thin gray outline. I would make the shape smaller and position it in the center of the pre-existing white circle, with the bottom of the outline running along the rim of the hat. I would add a red rectangle into this and then reshape this to be a blocky letter M. And I would add shading to this comprised of darker red rectangles reshaped to follow the shape of the M. I would group everything I've drawn in so far and shrink it down to create space for the rest of the body. My general advice for creating beautiful art in the vector editor would be to start out by blocking out the 
the general forms that you want and adding on more details and shading. Don't be afraid to go back and tweak things after the fact. Or you don't want to spend hours adjusting this and that by one pixel here and one pixel there in a never ending mission for absolute unattainable perfection. You don't want to settle for something that's worse than your best if you don't have to. A simple bit of shading here or an extra bit of detail there could really elevate your work. You also want to consider the art style that you want for your project. Some art styles will use gradients for their shading. Others might just use a three tone cell shaded look. Others might not have shading at all. Some art styles are highly detailed and others are simpler and more minimalistic. When choosing your art style, consider what feeling you want your project to invoke. What other games or animations that you want to bring to your audience's minds when they engage with your project and the amount of time that you have to invest into the art and animations. You can also save a lot of time with your artwork by duplicating any sections that are mirrored on both sides. A lot of sprites will be near symmetrical so it's a lot quicker to duplicate limbs and facial features and then add small edits, tweaks and details for variation on each side. The vector editor is also incredibly intuitive when it comes to animation, far more so in my opinion than the bitmap editor, which requires you to erase and redraw anything which changes between frames. In the vector editor you can just move and reshape parts of your sprite, meaning that you can quickly and non-destructively make some really good looking animations, which is great for both animating sprites for games or making full animations within the scratch editor. But I'll show you a quick example, and for this I'll need a simple sprite to demonstrate this on. There we go, that will do. Let's animate this little guy jumping straight up and down. I made a new costume, and you should name your costumes in whatever way makes sense to you, and for the first frame I just dragged it up a little and rounded it off. I wanted this character to feel quite fluid, as it's a slime, and was considering how gravity would affect its jelly-like body. I also had to pull the eyes up slightly, leading the motion of the sprite. And I centered each costume by dragging across to select the entire costume, and then dragging the selection over the center crosshair until it snapped in place. For the next costume, I made everything much narrower and thinner, dragging in the sides and dragging down the bottom of the sprite. Again, I moved the eyes upwards and just kind of tweaked and readjusted bits and pieces until it was looking like I wanted it to. It was much the same process for the next costume, dragging the eyes yet higher and making the body yet thinner and having the bottom drag down yet further. And for the next costume where the slime reaches the top of its jump, I made it into an almost floppy mushroom shape, widening out the top of the blob body, shortening the slime's tail or whatever you want to call it, and the eyes actually remain in the same place in relation to the top of the body, as though there's a degree of inertia acting on them, causing them to lag behind the rest of the body. However, they do start to move downwards in the next costume as the top of the slime continues to droop and the tail gets pulled further into the rest of the blob and for the costume after that the eyes drop further the bottom of the blob rounds off making it almost a circle. For the next costume where the slime is starting to fall back down the eyes continue to drop and now a tail starts to extend from the top then the slime starts getting thinner and longer again but inverted within the costumes on the right with the bottom being rounded off and the top being a thin narrow tail. The eyes get progressively lower in the sprites and I did two costumes in this pattern. Then when the slime lands back down I flattened out the bottom of the sprite and widened it into a rounded triangle. I pulled in the top sides a little to make it shaped almost like a chocolate chip or something and instead of perfectly centering this costume I made sure that it was centered horizontally but that the bottom of the sprite lines up with the bottom of the first costume where the slime is just idling. For the next costume the sides of the slime pull up and out like they're splashing upwards and the top middle continues to pull down. I adjusted the highlights and shadows to fit and in the next costume the slime starts to round back off so that it has a slightly more squat version of the idle costume and in this costume the eyes begin to rise back up. This is the last costume that I need for the vertical jump animation. How you go about implementing your animation is going to depend very heavily on what your project is and what the animation is for, so I won't go into it too much here. Play around with how quickly your animation plays and how much your sprite moves between frames until you have something that looks appropriately smooth for your game's style. Some art styles will be able to get away with slightly choppier animations than others, and of course you can add in multiple different animations for your character. The general principles of animation in Scratch will be the same as any other animation software, such as using squash and stretch to exaggerate your character's movement and make everything feel much punchier. If your sprite is really really simple and more importantly symmetrical, you might be able to save a little bit of time by only animating the costume for one direction, left or right, then using Scratch's rotation system to flip it horizontally. I did this for the sake of this example but even for a sprite as simple as this one it doesn't look great because the highlights of the eyes flip when they shouldn't and if I was actually using the sprite in a game I would be sure to reanimate it for each side. This wouldn't take long because I could just duplicate the costume and flip everything except the eyes. So again how much work this would be would depend heavily on the complex complexity of your sprite. Hopefully now you understand how to use the Scratch Vector Editor to make beautiful and detailed artwork for your project. If there are any more Scratch tutorials that you'd like to see, let me know and I'll make those for you. And apart from that, thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. Like and subscribe if you did, it lets me know there's something to see more of in the Discord link down below, and I'll see you next week for another video. Bye!